Northwest Now is supported, in part, by viewers like you. Thank you. How can it be? How can this once thriving estuary possibly be in trouble? The answers are complex and interwoven, but also very knowable. And one of the answers is that we've lined Puget Sound with shorelines of stone. While this may come as a shock to everyday people, it's a well-documented concern amongst those who have spent decades doing the research, trying to save the sound. Amy Carey heads up Sound Action, a watchdog group that reviews every permit request for shoreline development, which includes all the cement and stone beach armoring that was installed to protect homes, marinas, and commercial projects. Puget Sound looks gorgeous. Looks like it's just doing fine. Um, and really what's um, the most sort of unfortunate secret is when you really look a little bit deeper, um, we have created um, uh, such significant habitat loss, which is why we have all these um, ecosystem backbone indicators that are in such decline, whether that's forage fish that are um, plummeting in their populations, Chinook that are at a fraction of their historic levels, herring, and of course on up to the orcas. And the reason that that has happened is not some uh, mystery. It's happened because we've allowed on our watch this sort of un- fettered and in some ways unregulated development, shoreline development. A lot of that is shoreline armoring and, and then it can come with the, the sort of structures that go right along with that, whether that's overwater structures and docks or marinas. Um, so we have a waterway that is really probably on the other side of the brink of collapse. We have a very, very small amount of time to maybe turn this around. Kerry's group is part of a coalition that has sued the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The claim is the Corps has failed to regulate shoreline development and enforce the Clean Water and Endangered Species Act. Those laws are supposed to be protecting Chinook salmon and steelhead, both down by more than 90 percent since 1900. Kerry, like many others in this effort, has the same concerns about local government's enforcement of the Shoreline Management Act and the State Department of Fish and Wildlife's enforcement of the Hydraulic Code, where researchers produce the science justifying strong protections on the one hand, while the regulatory side approves 600 permits per year on the other. These are pretty strong and good laws um, in the Hydraulic Code. Most of the time they're not even being fully applied. That's sort of a first threshold. Then there's the issue of enforcement of if they aren't being applied, is anybody even you know, going f to sort of fix the issue? If a property owner has illegally built some giant bulkhead or, or something like that, that's, that's kind of a different basket where we focus on the first and foremost of, are you applying the, even the most simplest um, essence of the hydraulic code to projects? And what we've found is that that is not happening. Kerry says 70% of central Puget Sound shorelines are armored in one way or another. Towering piles of riprap form the foundation for miles of railroad track and breakwaters all across the region. And sound wide, about a mile of riprap or concrete gets laid along the shore every year, with three quarters of it done on residential property. So it's not just industry, it's regular people who think they're protecting against beach erosion, but who in fact are actually starving their beach of sediment and turning it into a hostile environment for small fish and collapsing the food chain from herring to salmon all the way up to Puget Sound's unique population of southern resident killer whales, whose numbers continue to decline. The Marine Survival Project involves about 60 organizations trying to figure out why forage fish, salmon, and steelhead populations have crashed. On this day, Philip Dion's crew is in Commencement Bay, netting juvenile salmon coming out of the large rivers in the South Sound, mapping their travels, their abundance, their type, and using that data to gauge returns in later years where the news continues to disappoint. 
While the job today is to count juvenile salmon, Dion's research specialty is forage fish, where as an example, the stock of Cherry Point herring up north is down 90% since the 1970s, with other notable declines all across Puget Sound. Beach armoring's degradation of the near shore and beach habitats is thought to be a major factor. So the reason that shoreline armoring matters is because it interrupts the processes that really create the beaches in Puget Sound. So there's a couple aspects of that. Uh, if where we're standing right now, I should probably have some SPF 50 on right now because there's no shade on this beach. So when those eggs are left on the beach, they're high and dry and the microclimate of the beach with overhanging vegetation is very important. When people build armoring, oftentimes they remove all the trees. So there's no more shade, the beaches become hotter and drier. So that's a big problem. The other reason is that uh, the habitat that's created by the erosion of those bluffs, which contributes the sand and gravel to the beaches, gets stopped. And so the substrate becomes less suitable for habitat. So we get more coarse substrate, more cobble beaches, which is less suitable for the survival of those eggs on the beach. And the evidence of scoured beaches leaving behind poorly sorted cobble is easily observable everywhere in Puget Sound. Truly fish-friendly beaches and shaded, well-vegetated shallow water holding areas are few and far between these days. You know, there's also reflective wave energy that actually increases the scour rate of those beaches. And it becomes sort of this, you know, domino effect where if you have a beach that's being nourished by the shoreline and you armor that beach, you've cut off that sediment supply. It's almost like building a dam to the sediment supply. Everybody down drift from your property is then gonna have less sediment coming to their beach. And so their beaches are gonna erode more quickly and they're gonna feel pressure then to armor their beaches as well. So it's a domino effect. Even where there's good freshwater habitat, young salmon eventually have to move out of relatively protected creeks and beaver ponds only to find themselves in a cement and stone-lined saltwater bathtub, where much of the protective habitat is gone. They'll never fulfill their destiny by returning to spawn to provide a lucky catch for a tribal member or sports fisherman or to feed a hungry orca. The Wild Fish Conservancy's Director of Research, Jamie Glasgow, is proud of the work his group did to restore the lower portion of Snyder Creek near Olympia. There are a lot of small streams that are blocked uh, by undersized culverts. For decades, an old, narrow culvert decimated Snyder Creek's native fish runs. But a quarter million dollar culvert replacement project and a decade of recovery is finally allowing wood and sediment to flow naturally as small fish dart around in the well-protected creek, making their miraculous change from freshwater to saltwater fish. Glasgow says species are blinking out, and despite efforts like this one to improve fish passage, the problem with armoring isn't just about industry or the shoreline around Seattle. It's all across Puget Sound, mostly involving private waterfront property owners. You know, a, an individual landowner may, may do this thinking, well, what's, what's one more bulkhead? Uh, and, and unfortunately, that, it's, it's that kind of thinking that, that really gets us into trouble, whether it's bulkheads or any of the other habitat modifications we make, uh, because the, the impacts of any individual bulkhead really uh, accumulate as, um, as you consider the fact that with 2,500 miles of shoreline uh, and almost a third of that distance armored already, um, the, the impacts are compounded, uh, they're cumulative. And, uh, and those impacts really vary depending on the characteristics of each site, but they generally include a, a steepening and coarsening of the beach in the vicinity of the, of the bulkhead. Um, and that has implications for forage fish spawning and for the ability of juvenile salmon, for example, to escape predation when they can't get into the shallow um, gently sloping beaches that larger predators uh, can't access. Glasgow is concerned about the regulatory culture as well, where a lot of work is being done on the one hand to restore freshwater and micro watershed habitats all across Puget Sound, but on the other hand, where in any given year, five bulkheads might be removed, but another 20 installed. Almost all of the shoreline of Puget Sound is identified as critical habitat for Puget Sound Chinook. And so there should be, you would think, that, um, that would result in, uh, in increased protection of those habitats. Uh, but, but we really, um, despite having some reasonable regulations on the books, we're not seeing consistent implementation of those rules. And uh, I get the sense that landowners, uh, again, who pick up on this, 
uh, see um, a, a roll of the dice. I'm going to build this bulkhead without a permit uh, and see if I get away with it. I probably am going to get away with it, but if I don't, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have to pay a penalty, uh, but that's the cost of doing business in Puget Sound. And, uh, and I see that happening, uh, and, uh, and that's a sign of ineffective regulations, even when they are enforced. While small efforts like fixing the Snyder Creek Fish Passage may eventually add up to restore the abundance of the Sound's many species, work on what's called a landscape scale is crucial too. And the showcase example of that is the restoration of the Nisqually River Delta, where in 2009, old dikes were knocked down, allowing farmland to be reclaimed by the tides. Over the years, Glynis Nakai has been monitoring slow progress, and she's optimistic now that with 75% of the Nisqually's upstream watershed protected thanks to cooperative landowners, the stage is set for the eventual restoration of the entire food web in the estuary. Monitoring the effects of the dike removal, monitoring fish, monitoring sediment, invertebrates, birds' use of the area, all of that monitoring has really identified how restoring a habitat is restoring the food chain. You know, this is an area that was um, blocked off from tidal influence for a century. Once it was opened up, then the sediment was deposited with that the vegetation. When you have vegetation that creates habitat, it's creating habitat for the invertebrates. Those invertebrates are going to be a food source for the salmon, particularly when they're fry or smolts, using the estuary as a nursery. And so it's that continuous change of habitat that's actually developing the productivity and increasing the productivity of the area. The Nisqually Estuary is an example of what can happen with a regional effort, because to make it happen, other watersheds and stakeholders contributed their salmon recovery funds to get this 763-acre estuary reclaimed. And the unexpected payoff is that salmon from other unrecovered watersheds are actually traveling to use it to grow and prepare for their epic journey to the ocean. But the ocean is yet another problem. Even with new proposals to reduce predators, to further regulate fishing, and to designate the Sound as a no-discharge zone, salmon survival in the deep waters of the Sound and the Pacific Ocean has been bad for years. And that's for reasons that are a little harder to define, but may include increased temperatures and more acidic pHs. Now, the Nisqually Tribe's David Trout says some might think poor ocean conditions means all the efforts restoring freshwater habitat and the Sound's near shore is pretty much wasted. Not so, he says. We're in an unusually bad series of ocean conditions, no question about it, and hopefully we'll cycle out of that. Um, but ocean conditions are tending to, to get worse over time, which makes the work that we're doing in Puget Sound and in our watersheds even more important. They need homes to come to, they need to be able to feed in Puget Sound, they need to be as strong and as healthy as possible when they hit those bad ocean conditions so they can survive. It makes our investment in time and energy and people in our local watersheds that much more critical. Maximizing those opportunities means making the entire Puget Sound watershed as fish-friendly as possible, even in this era of declining budgets. Examples? A recent court ruling will help replace culverts that inhibit fish passage. Farming non-native Atlantic salmon is now banned. And there's a massive effort to reduce stormwater contamination. But replacing or knocking out miles of the Sound shorelines of stone may be even harder because of the scale of the problem and because of the proposed weakening of the Endangered Species Act by the Trump administration. So it may well fall on the shoulders of landowners and local code enforcement officials to promote development choices that actually allow for some erosion and over time fund grants to replace those shorelines of stone with softer, more fish-friendly treatments called soft armoring, which for several years now have been identified identified as a priority in the region's shoreline master plan. You know, protecting these nearshore habitats is absolutely critical. These are the basis for the ecosystem in Puget Sound. This is what feeds the things that feed fish, that ultimately feed killer whales and feed us. And we're losing our shorelines day by day, foot by foot, yard by yard. 60% of our shorelines in Puget Sound have been impacted one way or another. We, we can't afford to lose anymore. We need to protect the existing ones. We need to restore the critical ones and enhance the ones that aren't working well. By 2050, another 2 million people will be packed into central Puget Sound, bringing the total population in the watershed to more than 6 million. Unfortunately, human activity at every level hurts fish. 
Pavements cause more contaminated runoff. Sprawl eliminates habitat and impacts water quality. And the pressure to build shorelines of stone increases for those clamoring to live along rivers and the shores of the Sound. And now there's a new human threat. It turns out that even treated wastewater released into the Sound is carrying a witch's brew of pharmaceuticals that threaten the food web. There's lots of different effects. So mainly you have potential for um, uh, impacts to growth, reproduction, um, their immune system, behavior. Jim Metter is a toxicologist at the Northwest Fishery Science Center, where the juvenile salmon captured in the nets during shoreline surveys are showing up in the lab loaded with drugs. We find a lot of uh, antibiotics, which was a surprise. Um, 16 or 17 in water and about half of those in fish tissue. So that can actually suppress good bacteria and enhance pathogenic bacteria, which is really um, detrimental for the fish because they have you know these pathogenic bacteria around them, um, and that basically kills them within a few days. Uh, growth effects are huge. We find these um, uh, metabolic regulator compounds like people take for um, diabetes and their lipid control. Well, those are good therapeutic effects, but for fish, they actually need these compounds. So they they want their lipids, they want normal glucose levels. So that can definitely impact their growth. Behavior, a lot of people find um, antidepressants. We found a couple important ones, Zoloft and Prozac in these fish at levels that other people have found causing effects um, in the lab, in these lab fish. So we can assume that in the field, these fish are also probably affected and it changes their behavior. And these fish are so highly tuned that any abnormal behavior in their their toast. I mean, they get preyed on by a bigger fish. While building shorelines of stone lies within the control of human behavior and decision making, taking drugs created with today's synthetic molecules is less discretionary because they benefit human health. But further down the food chain, even wastewater treated to today's standards creates a random chemistry in the waters of the sound that in reality may be yet another stepping stone on the path toward future extinctions. When your doctor prescribes a medicine for you, they also have to know the indications, contraindications, and mixture effects. So they got some drugs you don't mix. The fish don't have that choice. They got all these chemicals coming at them, and a lot of them are additive, probably synergistic, and interacting negatively. The Duwamish Waterway is a well-known source of industrial contamination, and small salmon fry in the Green River that get flushed down early just don't survive because of the mortality associated with several Superfund sites, shoreline armoring, and contaminated water. So here too, state and federal crews conduct regular netting surveys and data collection in an effort to save the endangered Chinook salmon, whose numbers are down 90% since 1900, with what's left fading fast all across the Salish Sea. Uh, the purpose of this project is to figure out where in the outmigrant pathway for juvenile Chinook salmon are they getting exposed to contaminants. Um, we know from previous work that we've done that the juvenile salmon that are leaving the Duwamish are exposed to a cocktail of all kinds of chemicals, uh, PCBs, PAHs, pharmaceuticals, and so uh, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly where they're getting exposed so that you can target remediation to get the, those contaminants out of there. The Stormwater Strategic Initiative, the governor's various task forces on salmon and orca, dozens of interest groups and thousands of agency employees and volunteers spending more than a billion dollars over 20 years. It's all just the start of what it's going to take to prevent extinctions of species like the Chinook salmon. One of the real difficulties is that survival is dependent on the management of habitat, water quality, and toxics starting at the very crest of the Cascades and only ending in the deepest waters of Puget Sound. And the work on the Green Duwamish is just one example of that expensive top-to-bottom assessment and recovery that's needed. We're looking at the chemistry and what's going on there, and if we, if there's definitely an effort to, to fix that. There are also efforts to restore um, the physical habitat. Um, it is difficult sometimes to, to get those to weave together so that we're, we're making an impact. Um, there's a lot of restoration in the upper part of the river, but that will be wasted if these fish come down and they have to swim this gauntlet of contaminants. So you have to do that. These fish are not using the lower part of the river very well. Uh, there's not a lot of habitat. That's a harder thing to fix, but 
collectively, if we're making more fish upstream and we're cleaning up the downstream, overall it should be effective. Every reach of the sound is affected. On Hood Canal, the Wild Fish Conservancy conducts net surveys in remote areas trying to compare the number of fish produced by the good habitats to what they find in areas that are more developed. One of the spots targeted for restoration is the area around Tuano State Park. Micah Waite comes here frequently and says it's a prime spot for restoration because of all the innocent looking features that actually add up to problems. The riprap shoreline, a nearby boat lodge that has formed a sort of tidal dam and made for a coarse beach, and an elevated picnic area that used to be a couple of acres of shallow water used as a holding area by fish migrating in and out of the nearby creek. Almost the entire shoreline has an abrupt break like this. It all looks innocent enough, but Waite says the attitude that this one spot won't affect anything, that each property owner has the right to protect their beach against the armoring on another, is all adding up to possible extinctions for endangered species. Unfortunately, protecting your beach and protecting your house also has an impact on uh, the public trust, on the shoreline, on the fish, on the salmon, which are an icon and are part of the natural heritage of Washington. Um, and the salmon of Washington belong to all the people of the state and individual actions are a part of the problem that is causing that decline. Um, so to the extent that uh, we could ask individual landowners, hey, do your part, um, there are ways to protect your property without building a hard, uh, hard armoring or bulkhead, um, we'd like to see that happen. While most reasonable stakeholders agree that protecting public access and private property rights around the Sound is important, to save the Sound's endangered species, restoring habitat, whether it be on private lands, public parks, or near the property of the region's largest industries, has to be a collective priority. Yeah, I think without dramatic shifts in public policy and fisheries management, we likely are headed to uh, some functionally extinct populations within Puget Sound Chinook. Uh, we may have some remnant populations, almost like a museum piece in some of our bigger, wilder rivers that would stick around but I don't think we get to recovery and I do think that potentially uh, the southern resident killer whale population would go extinct with a lack of prey base. Wade hopes that doesn't happen, as do we all. The bottom line, in the end, only a new political will will save the sound. One that calls on landowners, tribes, fishermen, industry, regulators, politicians, and taxpayers to take the concrete and expensive steps necessary to restore habitat, improve water quality, restrict harvests, and protect wild fish, and curb development and the shorelines of stone that development tends to bring. Puget Sound can be saved. There is still time on the clock. I came from the East Coast where I really felt like we had already done so much damage that there wasn't a good way to come back but living on the West Coast, in Washington in particular, we have such, uh, I guess, uh, salmon conscious and well-educated citizens that if they really thought about it and what their impacts were, that they would make the right choices if they had the information at hand. And so I guess I, I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic. Um, from what I'm seeing out here today. And so we as a society have to decide what are we gonna do about it? Are we gonna support um, regulations um, and funding sources that help address those issues? And it's, it's just being responsible for living here. It's just part of living here. And if you wanna live here and you wanna make this, um, continue to have this be a wonderful place. You have to be aware of everything that we do as people and you have to take responsibility for it. When do we reach a point where it is not possible to recover what we've got left? So that's that to me is the real question and, and, I, and I can't help but ask when are we going to really get serious and pull out all the stops? When are we going to reach a point where we're going to say, you know, we just can't afford to allow steelhead or chinook to be caught in fisheries, either targeted or as bycatch, um, because there's just not enough of them and, and we're scraping the bottom. And if we don't pull out all the stops and do everything we can to recover these populations, um, then we're going to lose them. I think salmon are going to be in Puget Sound for the next 10,000 years. There will be some form of salmon. There will be some salmon runs. They're a very resilient species. They're a species adapted to catastrophes and volcanoes and glaciers. Um, but I don't think we're gonna have populations of salmon that will support 
the communities, the livelihoods, and the ecosystems that we historically expected them to and that we relied on them to. Uh, you know, there's, there's really just, there's not a lot of uncertainty here. Protect habitat. And we already have the tools to do that. It's a known entity. We know what to do. Do it. Um, do it and do it well. And, and truthfully, that is the only chance that we have. And it is a very small, narrow window of opportunity here to save not just the orcas or not just the salmon, but truly Puget Sound and the Salish Sea. We tend to pit salmon recovery in Puget Sound against all of our other needs, and, and it seems to be a separate discussion from the economy, and we need to be smarter about that. The environment and working together on this stuff is so critical to our economic health and our health of our communities and our people, and you know, we're running out of time. The window is closing. Their opportunities are there, and we can still make a difference, but the longer we wait, the harder it gets and the more expensive it gets, so we need to start now and invest in a serious way to make this happen.